dear friends, dear audience, we are beginning our event. Uh, I would like to begin it with uh, my uh, thanks to the representatives of Viewpoint uh, for their hospitality. Uh, Viewpoint uh, functions also as a place where you can um, see uh, and purchase uh, the uh, Ukrainian art, so I encourage you to do so. Uh, I also want to mention that our today's event is a charity event and uh, we are raising money for Ukraine uh, together with the uh, Four Peace NGO. Uh, I think Maria will tell uh, us more about it later. Uh, a few words about myself. Uh, my name is Hanna Nikova uh, and I have been living in Vienna for, uh, the, for the last eight years. Uh, I'm trying to actively um, promote uh, uh, Ukrainian culture and to inform Austrian media about Ukraine. Uh, that is why uh, I am a co-founder and head of uh, the Media Center of Ukrainian Community in Vienna and also a curator of uh, a literary club, Literaktiv. Uh, by profession, I'm a book translator and a German teacher, and I haven't practiced English for a very long time. <laughs> um, I got my master's degree in literature at the National University of Kiev Mohila Academy, uh, and then I moved to Austria. And as I know, Maria Shuvalova, uh, our today's guest, is a doctoral candidate at the National University Kiev Mohila Academy. Uh, in 2019-2020, she was a Fulbright Scholar at Columbia University in New York. Her areas of specialization are comparative literature, contemporary Ukrainian literature, identity and memory studies, as well as translation. And uh, her today's speech is dedicated to the topic literature as a tool of propaganda the case of Russian contemporary military fiction. So, please, Maria. Thank you, Anna. And dear Yupoyo, thank you so much. It's the most beautiful and fascinating location uh, on my lectures because for the last year and a half, I used to give talks from a bomb shelter, from very strange houses, places, bus stations. So I really enjoy my chance to be here today in such an amazing place and enjoy very beautiful, very aesthetic Ukrainian art and clothing. So highly recommend to came here as well. And I really appreciate your effort on organizing media center and this charming event. Uh, like probably I'll I'll explain why I'm here. I'm going to ISM World Convention in New York. I I had this great chance to talk a bit more about Ukraine there, but I woke up in the morning because of early morning at 3 because of drone attacks and just keep myself busy to be distracted and then after a few hours I figured out from news reports that it was 35 Russian drones, some civilian apartments was damaged, civilians, a few civilians died and many civilians were injured. And the situation keep happening in Kyiv because I bathed there for many days and also I noticed there is, there is no headlines about that. So we are on the point of the war where tragedy became our routine and there is less response and commitment to that and I decided that I have to, to do something with that because when the tragedy became a routine a resistance also have to become a routine. So I decided on my way to conference have more talks and more outreach with the Ukrainian topic, and not only Ukrainian, but about our very important and impactful problems in different spheres of life, like lack of the expertise, a lack of epistemic uh, empathy, and gaps in our knowledge. So I really appreciate that it's working out and we're doing our job. So, uh, for Peaks is a wonderful NGO that provides people to people help and I personally know organizers and people who are on the board of this organization because they are scholars as me and I really appreciate
appreciate scholarly community, international scholarly community, as they had expertise in Ukraine February 24. Right? Immediately they started solving all the problems we had, and for peace was our reliable friend since the first day in Legend till this day. They, they're doing an amazing project with providing filters for water and providing other humanitarian aid. So I highly recommend to check their website. Probably when we'll post the video, we'll be mm -hmm. able to provide a link to the link and you will be able to read their report because they are fascinating. And uh, I'm wondering how should we proceed with auction today? Mm. <laughs> Probably we will just present gifts to our guests. Yeah. And we'll do more in, more activities uh, with the donation below the link and below the video. So my today's talk is dedicated to Russian military fiction, and I have to explain how I came up to reading Russian contemporary military fiction, because usually it's not the book I picked up. <laughs> uh, so, uh, as, as you know, uh, after Russian invasion in Ukraine in 2014, we observed outburst of so-called world war literature in Ukraine. Novels, sketches, short stories, essay, diaries, memoirs. First book were published in 2015, and by 2019, as Hanna Skorkina noted, the amount of books exceeded 600. So Jeffrey Stefanyuk translated article by Hanna Skorkina, War Books, recording the Russo-Ukrainian war in Crimea in Donbass into English. So we'll be able also to attach the link to this article for our English-speaking audience. And Hanna Skorkina not only made first attempt to catalog and categorize all Ukrainian books about the war, uh, but she also gave the understanding who the author were. So it was soldiers, professional writers, volunteers, civilian journalists, military journalists, internally displaced people, and family members of the case soldiers, ordinary Ukrainians and foreigners. So, uh, first I was reading these books, and one day, preparing for a conference, as I am a comparative scholar, you are inclined to compare things, and I thought, if Ukrainian writers are going to the front line, Volunteers are going to frontline journalists, they are also writing about that. So probably from the Russian side, all kind of people also going there, they have to write something. <laughs> there should be something out there. And if Ukrainians are willing to defend their land, and we can clearly read their motivation, the experience they are going through on the trenches. I was fascinated with why Russians are going there? What's well, their motivation? Maybe it makes them sad. It's like, mm. It was such, such. Scholars have to ask themselves very awkward questions. <laughs> and uh, it, I will be honest, it was really hard to find books like that. And um, give me a second to. I want to be very precise with titles so you will be able to Google to check to have your own impressions. Uh, it was very hard to find such fiction because uh, prominent Russian writers do not write about the war. Uh, like you might have heard, few prominent ballet dancers died on the Russian Ukrainian war, and Russian ballet dancers. The not volunteering to, to the army and also not writing about that. And best Russian poets don't die in the trenches as Ukrainian poets do. Nevertheless, I found few novels written by Russian authors about current Russian Ukrainian war. They have several features, but one of the most prominent part of them were written before the invasion of Ukraine. I, for example, in 2009, a fantasy novel, a genre defined by the author and publisher, Battlefield is Sevastopol, the correct spelling is Sevastopol, by George Savitsky was published. In 2011, the book won Lyudmila Kozinets Prize, named after a Russian writer and member of Literary Association of Crimean Branch of Union Writers of the USSR. And this award 
for the best work in science fiction, fantasy, military mysticism, and literary fairy tale uh, on the history, culture, current situation, and future of Crimea. And it was established by the organizing committee of Crimean Open Science Fiction Festival and was aimed to engage public interest in past and present of Crimea on peninsula's cultural traditions and cultural identities. So, to acknowledge the main topic stylistic, I will read the annotation of this award-winning book near future. The Russophobic policy of Ukraine's orange authorities <laughs> provoked a war, a new Crimean war. Mm -hmm. American and Turkish peacekeepers occupied rebellious Sevastopol. Breaking all international <coughs> agreements, the nuclear aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan it's very funny because now this Ronald Reagan is just a piece of metal from the museum. Mm -hmm. So, aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan and the battleship Iowa enter the Black Sea. What can destroy this monster? <laughs> only, only Russian submarine. <laughs> American armor boils under the crushing blows. Aircraft carrier Ronald Reagan is boarded by Russian Marines and landed. Landing ship of the Black Sea Fleet under cover of Guard Cruiser Moskva. What an irony. It's on the bottom of the Black Sea now. Rush to help insurgent Sevastop. So, very nice, very deserving book about the future of Crimea and cultural identities. In 2009, another book appeared. It also was this book by George Savitsky, and it's also so called fantasy. And it's titled The Battlefield in Ukraine Broken Trident. Interestingly, a uh, biography of George Savitsky is uh, unavailable on the internet. I also couldn't find his photos, presentations, or something like that. But he wrote more than 50 books, mm -hmm. so very prolific authors. And they were mainly about battles and this kind of battles when Ukraine was and Ukraine is occupied and destroyed. And the reason is, of course, nasty Americans that threaten the <laughs> whole world with nuclear weapon. That's why. It's they have been destroyed in Ukraine as well as them. So I have I have my own assumptions that it might not be a real author, mm -hmm. but just I as well. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nevertheless, I would like to also read for you a description of this book because uh, all of them are available only in Russian. So broader audience like will miss huge fun. So mm -hmm. the book of the battlefield in Ukraine broke and tried them. The year 2010, <laughs> having provoked riots, the orange Nazis unleashed a civil war in Ukraine. With the help of peacekeeping continent of NATO, under cover of American aviation and armored vehicles, Western Ukrainian punishers <laughs> with a trident on their shoulders begin exterminating Russian-speaking populations, arising entire cities from the face of the earth. Poltava perishes in a fire. Dnipropetrovsk is destroyed. Towns on the left bank of Dnipro, Crimea and Novorossiya are rising against invaders. Russia is helping the resistance fighters with the, with the latest weapon, volunteers and military advisors. They will break the fucking Bandera Trident. <laughs> Such an interesting fantasy about it. In 2009, novel by Fyodor Berezin was published. It's novel called War 2011, War Against NATO. And Fyodor Berezin is a very interesting figure. 
and pretty, pretty famous in more broader contexts because it has very prominent interviews. We'll get back to it. Mm -hmm. So in 2010, Berezin's book won an award, Starbridge. It's a festival of fantasy held in Kharkiv mm -hmm. since, uh, since 1991 to 2014. And the festival is intended to connect Ukraine and Russia, but all the books in Russia may be presented on the festival, of course. Jury is very unusual for a cultural festival uh, because it features members of Kharkiv Academy of Internal Affairs. So uh, I really uh, was enjoying the book by, by Olga Bertelsen about Ukrainian intelligentsia in the labyrinths of KGB. It's a book about Russian active measures on Ukrainian intelligence in 1960s and 1980s. Mm -hmm. How diversity of Ukrainian intelligentsia was used against it to reduce resistance. And just my assumptions that still some active measures with literary festival might be might be still keep being present in Kharkiv and mm -hmm. it might be but I'm not an expert in active measures, so it's just my assumption. But I highly recommend the book by Olga Bertelsen. So let's let's read one more book description. And, uh, it's a book by Fedor Beretti, War 2011. Near future, be betrayed by its own elite. Ukraine is occupied by American troops. <laughs> NATO war planes in the sky. Romanians occupied Snake Island. And the Turks landed in Crimea. The democratic West diligently ignores the aggression. Kyiv is silent. And the Ukrainian army does not resist invaders. But there are still people loyal to military duty and officer of honor. NATO, and here author means Russian backed separatist and Russian combatants, of course, that's an officer with an officer of honor. NATO hawks are on fire, shot down by a rebellious missile division. A fighter aviation regiment refuses to obey the orders of Kyiv capitulators and urban partisans arrange hell on the earth for invaders. So, I just want to give you a sense how similar all book descriptions are because it's just three examples out of the whole bunch of the literature like that. Mm -hmm. It's very spread on the internet, you can buy it for one or two dollars also. These books are well represented in all Russian bookshops, so if you're entering the bookshop and there is a stand where there is more chances people will buy the literature, so this kind of literature on this stand. Also, these books are awarded, journalists write about them, so on and so on. And uh, several and more and more books keep being published. Uh, for example, I give you just a few titles for you to enjoy. George Savitsky, Rage of Novorossiya. Or George Savitsky, Helicopter Pilots of Novorossiya, Siege of Kyiv. Uh, another book of, uh, of the same author, of George Savitsky, Classing Wolfhound, Burn Banderas Bastards. And, um, and more and more. Interestingly, when Russian full scale invasion started failing, this author keep writing. Mm -hmm. They still describing Siege of Kyiv. Mm -hmm. They still, des still describing how Russian aviation is successful in ruining the capital of the city. So, some more and more such books are appearing, so and they're less and less connected to the reality, of course. Uh, and so, you um, to booster some changes, we have to be more attentive to stuff 
that surrounds us and more attentive to different kind of literature that is present. Because I'm often asked, and I, I'm sure Hannah is often asked, like, how to save Russia, change the society, blah, 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 blah. It's a very awkward question, of course, because uh, it's more complicated than just saving someone. But we have to start with being more attentive. For example, paying attention to literature like that, and that huge amount of people are reading that, and part of them may believe in peacekeepers, in Nazi orange, and so on and so on. So I believe we have to. So I, I'm grateful for a chance to spread more information about that. And uh, part of journalists. Uh, it was Russian media who picked up these books and told that this war, contemporary war, was predicted by great Russian writers to just intensify the credibility of completely incredible things. And also justifying a war and normalizing it with the help of the narrative Great Russian literature predicted that. It's a narrative that also was spread in Western media, so it's not only local stories, it's not only novels for Russian audience, it's a bit bigger than that. So, uh, is it great Russian literature or great Russian propaganda? I have an interesting case study because on January 2016, The New Yorker published an interview with Fodor Berezin. The interviewer was Jack Heath who apparently knows Russian since works of Berezin had never been translated into other languages, as all book I mentioned before. Uh, and the interview begins with a mention of Berezin's current occupation. And Jack Heath introduces him the following way. One of those local fighters, Fyodor Berezin, became a deputy defense minister of what rebels call the Donetsk People's Republic, and now trains new recruits in tank and artillery. Berezin is unlikely leader in any war. Before all this took place, he was a sci-fi novelist in a job or historical fantasy. So you have already, you, you know a bit about works of Fyodor Berezin. And during the interview, Jack Heath three times highlight that Berezin radically changed his occupation, a writer who became a fighter. Mm -hmm. And yet, Berezin is a professional combatant. Even if you Google his name in English, you can mm -hmm. find his English Wikipedia with his bio. And in 1977, he entered anti-aircraft defense forces training school in Russia. Graduated that in 1981 as, and served as an anti-aircraft officer first in Kazakhstan, then in the Far East. In 2016, Berezin was a deputy minister of defense of so-called DNR, and he is on sanction list in the UA, European Union, and elsewhere. And uh, therefore, or we may assume that Jack Heath either did not prepare for the interview or deliberately misleading readers and fact checkers, it seems, did not fact check this interview and probably editorial board is okay with viewing a terrorist, a platform, and allowing him to share his opinion about the war, but as you and Jack Heath call it local conflict. And Jack Heath and Berezin uh, also are talking not only in general, they also think and um, how this local conflict will end and Jack Heath just wondering what genius uh, Russian writer uh, think what is the best solution on all of that because probably you're very deep and you are local, you change your life dramatically, and you are on the ground, and you are a genius or Russian writer, so probably you know how to handle conflicts, wars, and geopolitics. And Berezin answers, the best result for Russian-speaking people in Donetsk is complete destruction of regime in Kyiv. Mm -hmm. Soviet Union, 
It was a special civilization. And now it mourned for it. Russia today is a capitalist country like United States, not like the Soviet Union, which represented a new type of civilization in which you can live without undermining and exploiting other people. One day I hope it will be reborn and maybe in some other country. In the interview, Perez presents himself as a great Russian writer who foresaw the war. Uh, there is, uh, yes, and there is uh, uh, this narrative that Russian literature is a great literature, and people inclined to be less critical toward it. And I, I, I just imagine a person from the United States who learned that in college and universities that Russian literature is a great literature and also literature is nothing to do with the politics and if a local local writer that dramatically changed his life really believes that he should be destroyed maybe that makes sense so your people are less critical with cultural stuff like that and uh, it also brings a lot of problems and questions for literary scholars, for security scholars, intelligence and counterintelligence scholars, because we can use how cultural narratives are recognized and how literature is recognized. And uh, it's very funny how Berezin uh, exploits and describes himself uh, as a prophet, a world-class writer. And uh, he says he say about himself. I used to read a lot of Tom Clancy and some publishers here call me a Russian Tom Clancy. <laughs> it's just a very nice self-presentation, but don't trust stuff like that. And it's very awkward that in this interview, uh, Berezin um, says a few times that Barack Obama is a simulacre, probably not a real president. It's just very awkward things. And uh, I also, uh, it was also interesting that the interviewer presented Berezin as a very unique writer that was refused to be published in English because his thoughts are so, so just world changing, game changing, but actually just very bad, very offensive and rude things like that. And if American readers will read at least part of that, they will be offended. I have, I prepared a part of translation for you. What the fuck? <laughs> Why is America the wealthiest country? Do you think it's because they are workaholic? That's hilarious. Americas, it just niggers and, and just gypsies. How can they work? They cannot even read and write. The USA is rich as they have money printing machine. Everyone knows that. It's not a state who owns it printing machines, but some private company. Did you, didn't you know that? Gosh, everyone knows that. They just print money and buy goods. That's why at their gas station, gasoline is cheaper than Russia. To make $100 costs them 4 cents as they need to pay only for paper and <laughs> uh, Why no one is protesting against that colonies and colonies that stupid Ukrainian, stupid character of Ukrainian origin. So, colonies know nothing. Colonies is stupid Ukraine. <laughs> I don't know. I, are they fucking stupid, mm -hmm. these colonies? And the main character petrifying you stupid Ukrainian colonies. I sure think they are fucking stupid. But there is one more thing. America has 12 atomic aircraft carriers. If everyone stop buying their dollars and pretending it's a real currency, they will bombard everyone fucking bitches, the niggers. <laughs> So it's very ironical that right now, because other countries try to reduce cost dependence of Russia and refusing to buy their stuff, Russia threatens the whole world by by, by weapon. 
my nuclear weapon. Uh, so it's very enjoyable to read in the end of this interview while the full slogan of the New Yorker journalism that matters. I hope that in light of this excerpt, the interview by Jack Heat will matter a bit more. Uh, so I, I will end up and make a conclusion here. So basically, in 2009, started began the production of huge amount of books with the same plot that all book I mentioned and many more uh, were telling in a fictional form with grasping plot but not very deep philosophical and uh, not very nice sentences I admit uh, started um, transmitting the following narrative that Ukraine do, do not exist as a nation uh, therefore they, they are divided in a week Ukrainian leaders cannot decide things independently and Russian Federation does not commit illegal actions, it's just safe and protect because the main responsibility is on NATO and US and of course Russia is the strongest country in the world uh, and it is about to be recognized as such but it's not hard to notice that these ideas they were existing even before especially if we check up some interviews by politicians or other intelligentsia, other Russians. Uh, for example, an interview by Alexander Dugin in 2006, uh, he stated things like, I assume that it's impossible to keep the unity of Ukraine if country joins NATO. If authorities uh, claim they want to join North Atlantic Alliance, this will mean the end of sovereign Ukraine we will withdraw economic support for Ukraine and turn the gas offers in addition to put it mildly diplomatically in this situation Moscow will stop restraining separatists in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine so it was published, this interview was published in a lot of platforms and analyzed by a lot of scholars as well so both Russian contemporary military fiction and the Ukrainian literature about the war they depict the Russian war against Ukraine nevertheless the, the ideas with which people are going and perceiving that dramatically different and, uh, and we have to change this case study shows us that actually literature might be weaponized and have to deal a lot with national security so we definitely have to change many of our approaches and be very cautious while reading, inviting and giving floor for our people that might promote uh, and support crimes and also uh, support a bit other form of propaganda because uh, you may have heard about a book by Peter Pomeranzo, this is not a propaganda, the war against reality, uh, because this kind of book, very unusual uh, mm -hmm. type of propaganda, but there is other more examples, uh, for example, Peter Pomeranzo in his book describe how um, fortune tellers, there was created websites and these websites sold uh, fortune telling stuff that you can you can help you can get help in interpreting your dreams like your horoscope tarot and like stuff about that and that was used to spread narratives and one one Russian journalist who was working in Russian bot firms she later flew Russia and did an interview with Peter and tell about a bit about the inner kitchen of all of that stuff how she professional journalists were very, very well paid to be to pretend pretending be a fortune teller and she has to create stories for example if the lady tried to figure out what this strange dream meant she has to explain that this dream meant that there is huge threat and it's from America and she has to be careful and probably 
probably be very cautious to American products and never buy them in supermarket. Mm -hmm. So it's very awkward how how smart and effective and diverse propaganda might be. And we are not aware of that because we are living in such a civilized world and we have to talk a lot about our blind spots. And it's of course very inconvenient and not a pleasant process. But we invite you to join that because it's prolific. So I have no more things to share with you and I would be glad to hear your question. Um, if I may, I had uh, one question. Uh, as I read the uh, topic of your, um, uh, of your proposal, uh, I thought um, that maybe you'll be dealing with the literature uh, that was written uh, between 2014 and 2022. And then I was really surprised that you, uh, you um, you found uh, so many novels uh, about a fantastic uh, near future, uh, <laughs> near future, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wanted to ask you why do you think why did they uh, begin to publish those novels uh, in uh, two thousand nine? Uh, is it because uh, we had <laughs> Yanukovych as a president? What uh, what was the catalyzer of, of those uh, processes? It's a great question. I haven't researched that and I believe I need more expertise in active measures and international relations and stuff like that. I hope to, pop, to, to work on the article with co-author co with another scholar to dive deeper in that. But what I can say right now is probably this invasion was planned long before. And one part of that is working with your own people to justify that and to normalize that as well. And that, that's the thing we have to realize. Yeah, so one can say it, well, this war was not predictive, it was planned. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. Yeah, and um, uh, two weeks ago I was in uh, Leipzig um, at the book fair and uh, Maria Stepanova, a Russian uh, oppositional poet, was uh, awarded uh, with a prize uh, for her uh, recent book, but also for her previous book, uh, which is called Девочки без одежды, if I'm not, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, oh, no, no, no. It was, uh, the, the previous book was a uh, winter poem, um, and it was written in 2021. Uh, and uh, as Maria Stepanova uh, says, she uh, was writing it about the Second World War, uh, but uh, many German uh, critics um, published articles about this book, uh, calling Maria Stepanova the new Russian Cassandra, predicting the Great War coming uh, 2000, uh, 2022. Uh, and this is just another blind spot of uh, Europe, I think, if, if they haven't seen uh, this war beginning 2014. That is what uh, actually uh, the book I uh, published uh, is about. It stands here, it's uh, an essay collection um, from Ukraine. Uh, I, I've uh, collected 22 texts. Uh, written by um, nine, 19 Ukrainian authors, uh, and these texts um, uh, begin uh, in the year 2014 uh, because uh, that is the year when our war uh, against Russian aggression started. Uh, and I'm really shocked that someone can see that and awards a writer for predicting the future that is already here. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we may also say that so many Cassandras in Ukraine, many even from the 20th century, who predicted and was aware of such a long historical events between Ukraine and Russia, so we have more Cassandras in Russia. <laughs> But it's very notable that only Russian writer is heard when they speak about it, but when Ukrainians are speaking about it, they're not heard. Or they called emotional. Yeah. yeah. It would be very interesting to see if uh, 
there's similar literature on Georgia, Chechnya in the years before that. So, uh, maybe now Kazakhstan. <laughs> maybe uh, Russian propaganda is preparing for every country around them <laughs> in the eventuality that they're going to need those books. Uh, in another way, they couldn't publish like 50, 60 books in such a short time, even if it's not well written, you can't write that fast. So that would be a very interesting topic. That's a great question, question actually. But you, even my use this one for everything, because they are so chauvinistic, not only in terms of Ukrainians, but all other nations as well. So just books of multiple uses, I may say. Oksana uh, Zabushko writes in her recent book, uh, The Longest Book Tour, uh, about um, many Slavic uh, scholars, like uh, Slavic literature scholars, uh, who um, deliberately um, ignored uh, Russian colonial, uh, colonialism in the literature and who didn't prepare, uh, not Russia, but Europe, uh, that Russia is not to trust. Uh, do you also share this uh, opinion? Yeah. That, uh, <laughs> Unfortunately, yes. Uh, it's it's broadly and commonly. It's, now it's a bit recognized. There is a huge discussion about that. I believe during the last year a lot of special issues was published about crisis in Russian studies and crisis in Slavic studies because Slavic studies it's just 95% of Russian studies and just some Japanese of Just don't shoot what is that. Mm -hmm. And also Asian studies and Eurasian studies all have these questions. So it's in general pretty strong crisis in academia on no crisis in knowledge production. And we I and more Ukrainian scholars. Katarina Zarembo and Roman Horvath. We also made a call of papers for a special issue. Uh, we called it Empathy versus Empire How Not Understanding of Imperialism Shapes Decision, Discourses, and Policies in and about Ukraine, Europe, and beyond. Because there are so many blind spots, and not only about Russian imperialism, but also Hungarian imperialism. Austrian imperialism and American imperialism as well, Israeli imperialism. So in general, we're very blind in our 21st century, very nice and democratic, about uh, declarative support of certain progressive and uh, democratic stuff while we have to deal with imperial policies, actually. So we try to, to have more voices in academia to talk about that, but discussion keep going and going, but that's true. Um, does anyone have any more questions? Uh. So thank you for your attention. We highly recommend to follow Media Center in all social medias, which you have Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. So we highly invite to follow up. I really hope you will have a Patreon so people will, will be able to support. <laughs> That's your a good effort. idea. We haven't uh, um, launched any, anything yet, but I sincerely love hope and thank you so much for your time. Thank you.